Hi there. So pleased to see everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we are here for uh, the one o'clock session, and this is a session empowering citizens uh, through the Princeton Gerrymandering Project and partners. My name is Sam Wong, and I'm a professor of neuroscience, and I also uh, am the proprietor of the uh, Princeton Gerrymandering Project, which is a project that I started a few years ago here at Princeton University. So I'm really pleased uh, to um, to welcome the co-panelists today, and I'm hoping that we have a good conversation today about an unusual use of um, technology in partnership with reform. And what I want to talk, what we're going to be talking about today, is the ways that technology can be used by reformers, uh, and then the way that technologists and people who develop innovative ideas can use their thinking for uh, for making change. And I think this is a perhaps unappreciated bridge. Um, our panelists today um, are really great partners. I've uh, found them to be uh, really excellent collaborators on this. And I'm really hoping that we'll have a pretty robust conversation towards the end. And I'll just mention them now. Um, working with me are uh, one alumnus, well, alumna and uh, one current student, uh, Preeti Iyer and Kyle Barnes. Preeti is class of 2020, Kyle is class of 2022. And they and my team at the Princeton Gerrymandering Project have been working together to uh, work on tools for helping citizens really engage with a, a critical function of our government, redistricting and, uh, and the prevention of gerrymanders. Um, and I think this is something that has really come to the fore with this year's election. Uh, at this point, we turn to the next uh, political battle, but also the next opportunity for, uh, for coupling citizens with their government more efficiently. And so this is uh, what I'd call little d democracy, uh, that is having representatives who are, are representative of the voters who elect them and little r republicanism in the sense of uh, having um, representatives who are in some way responsive to the voters. Um, our guide in this, uh, one of our guides in this has been Kumar Garg, who's a managing director at, um, at Schmidt Futures. And Kumar has, been, um, has done previous work um, in uh, the Obama administration, has, um, has really overseen a lot of really interesting ventures uh, through Schmidt Futures. And so we've been very fortunate to, uh, to get to know Kumar a bit, and we're hoping to get a good conversation going with Kumar. Now, what I'd like to do is just tee up the subject of redistricting and, um, and gerrymandering, which is unfair redistricting, uh, and really use that to, uh, to lead into what uh, Kyle and Preeti are going to talk about. And then we'll uh, pivot over to Kumar and then open it up for discussion. So let me just go ahead and get that started. And let me just start by um, showing things that are not terribly technical. Um, I'm just gonna start with a quote from, uh, from a president from 100 years ago. This is um, Teddy Roosevelt, who uh, was a Republican. Uh, and when he left office, he got really interested in uh, fair representation, in reform, and in good government. And, um, and he, having left office, was willing and able to speak his mind. Uh, and what Teddy Roosevelt said was, the national government belongs to the whole American people. Our whole experiment is meaningless unless we are to make this a democracy in the fullest sense of the word. And he said, if the minority is as powerful as the majority, there's no use of having political contests at all, for there's no use in having a majority. Now, as we sit here, we are waiting for a final word on the presidential race. And it's probably a good time to think back on the words of this previous president, because we're facing this peculiarity where we're seeing some strange things play out. Let me just make sure I can get this to operate. Um, where if you look here, um, he was talking at the end of the first Gilded Age. Um, and if you look here, this is now a graph of presidential races. And although our topic today is redistricting, I think this shows you what kind of peculiar time we're in. Um, the first Gilded Age from 1876 to 1896 was a period of close, bitterly contested elections. Uh, it was a time of racial division, technological disruption, economic inequality, and deep partisanship. And you can see here these two orange dots are presidents who lost the popular vote, but nonetheless won the electoral college and became president. And you can see here that they were part of a series of close presidential elections. And then we have a long stretch of less close elections. And then in our time now, we have once again, close presidential elections. And it's safe to say that whatever happens, uh, you know, honestly, the, I think there'll be a consensus developing. Um, I mean, there's already been a bit of a consensus developing that uh, about how the presidential races turned out, 
But once the dust has settled, this blue star is where the, uh, the, the race is likely to end up, which is yet another election that's within about five percentage points, um, no, certainly no more than Obama's victory of eight points in 2008. Um, that range of popular vote victory and an electoral vote battle uh, that is uh, uh, that we were watching play out slowly because of pandemic. And our time too is a time of racial division, technological disruption, inequality, and partisanship. And this is just to set up the topic of gerrymandering, which is not related directly to the Electoral College, but the idea that legislators can draw their own lines and make, make themselves safely ensconced in office. Uh, and this goes back, of course, several hundred years. And it's something I wrote about in uh, this New York Times piece, which I encourage you to, uh, to read because I think it uh, still has some value. And this on the right is a caricature of the first uh, gerrymander uh, signed by Governor Elbridge Gerry. Um, and, uh, and here we are several hundred years later with gerrymanders that separate representatives from their voters uh, and that distort the number of representatives. And so gerrymandering is still alive and with us very much. And our mission at the Gerrymandering Project is how does one overcome that? And I just wanna show you here some examples. This is a rogues gallery of gerrymanders. And I would say in some ways, this is actually a pretty, um, a pretty favorable time um, for dealing with gerrymanders uh, because in fact, all these gerrymanders that have been um, uh, drawn here, many of them have been undone either by new laws or are prevented by uh, divided government or, uh, or or other kind or independent commissions. And so this gerrymander in Florida, a congressional gerrymander is done away with. This one was redrawn by a lawsuit. This one was undone in state court. Uh, this one is likely to be undone because there are new district, uh, new laws governing redistricting in Ohio. And this one, North Carolina 12, uh, was also undone several times. And then finally in Michigan, there is a commission that's going to take over things. And then you might ask, okay, what about this one right here that was left? As it turns out, this one that was here um, actually has good qualities because it joins Spanish speaking populations of Northern Chicago and of Southern Chicago and gives them a chance to be represented. And this really kind of illustrates the kind of role that geography and people play. And I think that one thing I'm hoping that we're really gonna get to is the idea that you need to represent uh, people not through lines drawn uh, without knowing about them but really by knowing about the communities. Just to give you a sense of it, here is one uh, fix where this just goes to show that, uh, that lines themselves don't tell the story. If you look here, you'll see that on the left, this is in a court battle that happened a few years ago. Uh, these two maps are, uh, have uh, congressional district boundaries, the light blue are the congressional boundaries. The heat map is uh, population density. And you can see that a 50-50 vote could either lead to a really lopsided delegation that's 13-5 for one party versus the other party, or it could lead to a 9-9 uh, split delegation. And so the message I want you to get out of this is that power and equity go beyond just the shapes of districts, but also have to reflect the people who live in them. And you can take the same pattern of people, in this case, a fanciful depiction of uh, two equally divided communities of, of green colored voters and purple colored voters. And you can see that if green gets left in charge, they can draw themselves five out of six districts. Or if per the purples get in charge, then they can draw themselves four out of six districts. And so the, what this shows is that it's not just about shape, it's also about people. Now, I got into this uh, myself here at Princeton um, uh, after uh, learning about the bad 2012 gerrymander. And for a while, my team and I were interested in pursuing uh, justice in federal courts. Um, federal courts have started to take a really hands-off view about exactly when and whether to uh, engage in regulating uh, line drawing. And so the question is, who can do it? Uh, and so what I want to just show you is that, in fact, the future of pursuing fairness very much devolves to the states. Now, when we were in school, uh, we probably learned about states' rights as being uh, a thing that restricted people's rights, that uh, halted progress. But I would say under uh, current conditions, now that there are mechanisms in place for voters and for uh, citizens and even legislators to, uh, to act, now there's a 50-state um, process that in fact, a uh, 50-state route to uh, pursuing fairness. And this is just to show you our analysis which you can read about over at gerrymander.princeton.edu. And you can see that every state has its own um, uh, approach to uh, by which one can pursue fairness in redistricting. Uh, and just to give you a sense of it, um, here uh, uh, many states have an independent commission and that's illustrated here in California, Arizona, Colorado, uh, Montana, Idaho, and so on. Uh, we have a new commission that, uh, that my team at the Gerrymandering Project is starting to work with in uh, Michigan. 
Uh, there are other kinds of advisory commissions that are maybe not fully independent, but still have some measure of independence. And there was a new one that was just passed in 2018 in Virginia, I'm sorry, in 2020, just this week in Virginia by a two to one margin. So that's a really exciting development that we're really interested in. Uh, there's other legal routes to reform that are open, uh, but really I think I, what I wanna call your attention to is, uh, is this idea of public input. Oh, I forgot to mention divided government. So some states have divided government. So for example, Wisconsin has divided government, so does Minnesota. So there are states that have divided government, which again opens a possibility for, uh, for as many people to work together as possible. But really a, a dominant color on this map is the role of public input. Um, thanks to law, sunshine laws and uh, other laws uh, governing how districts are drawn, legislators are not the only ones uh, in the process. Legislators have an obligation, redistricting commissions have an obligation to take public input. Uh, it's not true in every state, but a number of states have them. And you can see here that there are a number of states indicated here, and this is not all of them, uh, but I would say that there's a, a number of states where the principal route to, uh, to getting um, uh, good input and, uh, and fairness would be these maps such as uh, states such as Georgia, Texas, and even some of these states that I haven't indicated in color. So for instance, Michigan has a public input requirement and some of these other states, Virginia has a public input requirement. So really there's a huge role for the public to weigh in. And the challenge until now has been doing it on paper. And I hope that Kyle and Preeti will tell you more about what they've done to really, um, to really short circuit that process and to make it more efficient. So generally speaking, our theory of change here um, is that redistricting reform, uh, this should say 2020 and beyond, sorry about that. Uh, our theory of change is that previously redistricting was done behind closed doors using proprietary software and using unshared data. And so previously it was this route that went through uh, that by which districts were drawn. Our feeling is that there's another route that's possible using um, publicly released data, which we're doing our best to make available uh, making available open tools for redistricting and input and evaluation. And that's where representable comes in and putting that in the hands of reformers, journalists, redistrictors, and if it comes to it, even litigators. And our hope is that this will be a process that leads to a, a better map uh, drawing process nationwide uh, and reform. And just to emphasize, this is a domain where people play a really critical role. And this is just an example of an event we had uh, a little over a year ago when we were able to have events in person. A little sad, but, um, but we were able to have events together in person. And the idea is that tech people and reformers can work together to, uh, to make change. So, um, so that's um, my overview. And I, what I'd love to do now is uh, turn it over to, uh, to the representable team and get them to uh, tell us a little bit more about, um, let's see, about uh, what they've developed. So why don't I turn it over to you guys? Awesome, thank you, Sam. Great, um, while Preeti gets her screen share going, um, I'll introduce myself. So we're really excited to be here. Thanks for the introduction, Sam. Um, my name is Kyle Barnes, class of 2022, one of the co-founders alongside Preeti and three other students of Representable um, and the current executive director. Can everyone see the screens okay? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we're really excited, as Kyle said, to kind of deep dive into our venture, Representable, and following what Sam was saying, how we are kind of bridging that gap between reform and data and incorporating data to um, hopefully democratize this redistricting process. So Sam went over some overall context on gerrymandering, but we wanted to pinpoint a, a, a specific example. Um, so to explain our story better, we wanna first take you to Prince William County in Northern Virginia. So Prince William County is a diverse county with a vibrant Latinx community. Over time, the county has become Virginia's only majority minority county. So it really requires political representation that mirrors and represents the needs of such diversity. In a system that works, the Latinx community would have unified representation and voting power to have a voice in electing an official that really cares about their needs. However, rather than placing the county's significant Hispanic community into one district, different district maps split the community up to eight times to minimize its power. And this tears apart a vibrant minority community and voting base into broken pieces with minimal impact. Prince William County also is unfortunately just one of the countless communities across the nation, as Sam was saying, affected by gerrymandering. 
And historically, ethnic and religious communities have been disproportionately affected by gerrymandering. In many cases, they're left without a fair voice in democracy. But we're finding ways to fight back to fix the system with data and allowing for a greater public input. A community of interest is a group of individuals who share common legislative interests and benefit from cohesive representation. These population groups are the building blocks for drawing counties and districts and city lines that ultimately dictate election outcomes. And why these are powerful is that by now, 26 states require these community groups to be respected when drawing districts. So these are legally enforceable fairness standards that make them incredibly empower powerful as public input um, forms. But in the absence of community data that is understandable to map makers and can be used to hold politicians accountable and map makers accountable, the status quo will prevail, incumbents will rarely lose and marginalized communities will continue to be forgotten. And that's why we created Representable to have this form of public input. We're creating a platform to collect, analyze and share crowdsourced community data to add more public input to democracy. And I'll hand it over to Kyle to talk a little bit more about specifically how the site works. Yeah, great. So just a brief overview of kind of how Representable operates. So community members start on our online survey by annotating their community interests, uh, the cultural, historical, economic, and social interests that bind them together. Then they draw a map. Um, so this map uh, is selected out of block groups, basic units of the census that comprise someone's community, so that their map can be easily understood and used by map makers. Then upon submission, this map is added to our database, which is a database of communities of interest, which is then used by organizations to advocate for their communities, by map makers to ensure that district plans take communities of interest into account, and by citizens and journalists to directly evaluate proposed maps. Um, where does this data go? Well, community data gathered through Representable can not only be visualized on our site, but can also be exported for use in public comment as a PDF um, sent directly to a commission or representatives. At the same time, these maps are also available at the industry standard GeoJSON format, meaning they'll be used by, behind the scenes when maps are actually being drawn or analyzed by experts. Uh, this data is standardized and actionable, empowering anyone to analyze and critique the mechanisms of our representative democracy, ranging from local to federal levels. Um, through easily accessible digital tools, we're trying to make communities visible so that voices of all backgrounds can be heard. This provides journalists and concerned community members with the critical community information that they need to ensure that our democracy respects the representation of all groups and to unmask what previously took place by an elite few behind closed doors. Um, but we can't do this alone. So we work with grassroots organizations who are already active in their states and local communities to launch community mapping drives, which encourage community members to put the power of maps in their hands. But this just scratches the surface of what we're doing because we're trying to grow fast and we're currently developing relationships with civic organizations who work in our 13 priority states with the goal of 100,000 communities by June of 2021. So our current team has seven undergraduates, soon to be growing even more, um, augmented by the policy experts and lawyers at the Princeton Gerrymandering Project, Sam and folks. Um, and we're philanthropically backed by civic venture partners, including Schmidt Futures. Currently, we work closely with organizations like the ones here to launch community mapping drives and develop partnerships so that these organizations are empowered to do the work gathering community data on the ground. Um, but time is short, especially at this critical moment in American democracy. Um, so our team is working at the intersection of academia, tech, and governance um, to try and build up our team's growth, our visibility, and credibility so we can empower community groups across the country. Um, we're focused on the upcoming redistricting cycle and are setting up the infrastructure to create routine change in many jurisdictions where community data and public input can influence democracy at local, regional, and state levels for years to come. At Representable, we're fixing a fundamental weakness in our democracy because we want to give every community in the country not just a voice, but a map so that they can fight for fair representation. So that communities like the Hispanic population of Prince William County can fight the politicians that want to split them apart behind closed doors. Thanks so much. All right, Preeti and Kyle, that was really terrific. Thank you so much.
Uh, last uh, and uh, certainly not least, we turn it over to Kumar Garg. So uh, Kumar, uh, I'm gonna stay on screen, I think, and um, let's just have a little chat. Uh, very interested in your thoughts about, um, about how all these things come together in, in your bird's eye view of, of, of this kind of reform. Well, it's great. it's great to join this community and it's great to be part of this conversation. Um, I mean, I think it's quite, <laughs> we're kind of in the jumble of the post election. So in some ways it's like very apropos that we're having this conversation now, but again, it's hard for me to know what I will say I will, <laughs> will remain relevant in a few weeks from now. But you know, I, I mean, what struck me, I feel like Sam, you and I started talking and working together uh, really closely on this about a year and a half ago, maybe, maybe a little more than that. Right. And I think the big thing that jumped out to me <clears throat> was this idea that uh, this thing that is like now on everyone's mind all the time, which is how do we actually bolster and strengthen democratic institutions in the United States? is something that technologists can actually contribute something to. So obviously there's lots of ways that we as citizens can, can help talk about democracy. And there's obviously a lot of ways that we need to have important governance reforms, but, I, uh, uh, but usually when people talk about, you know, all the different challenges, including redistricting and gerrymandering, you know, they, it's usually just a political question. You know, we need to have politicians in key roles that take these issues more seriously. And I, what I found powerful was this idea that if you actually look at uh, folks who are working on com combating gerrymandering, citizen activism has actually been a huge part of the story, whether that's, you know, pushing for these statewide commissions or, you know, litigation. And often, uh, I think when we first started talking, I think a couple, two different data points jumped out to me. One is that courts are actually quite sensitive, courts and commissions to public input. And so citizen voice actually matters a lot. Um, the second is that it's actually pretty hard as a process for citizens to navigate. And so actually having the data and the tools to be able to propose you know, uh, maps, to be able to say we're a community of interest end up making a huge difference. So on one level, your voice goes far, but another level uh, actually being able to organize your voice requires help. And so what I've been really struck by is you know the Princeton gerrymandering project is not that big of an operation. No. Uh, uh, you know, Representable started off as a student project, and here it's been actually been able to do a ton of good. And so, you know, I think that part I think really jumps out to me, which is even though these feel like oh my god, you know, you know billions of dollars are getting spent on elections, on the margins when it comes to building powerful new tools on helping. Uh, protect democracies through citizenship, uh, to, you know, through these sort of activities, you can actually really get a lot done. And so I, that's the part that really I find. And so as we sort of go into 2021 with census completion, with, you know, what will be probably another mess of, you know, how um, redistricting will happen, you know, I'd be curious what you think are the areas where, you know, young technologists or technologists or others could really lend a hand uh, and really have an impact. Yeah, I think um, I, I think you're right that the role of technologists to really empower these things is often um, underappreciated uh, to the point of being unappreciated. So, or not un unappreciated, but like, just for example, I'll, I'll give you an example. If you see an abuse happening in public, uh, or if you see some kind of act of brutality, the immediate response today is to get out your phone and to take a movie of it, right? Whether it be uh, George Floyd or whoever it might be to take a picture of it. This is a device that was developed to let me read my email, to let me browse the web, to let me look up information, right? It was, it, you know, to look at cat videos or what have you, right? I mean, to watch TikToks, you know. Um, but in fact, it can also have enormous power. And the technologists who developed it didn't necessarily have in mind, oh, you could, you could photograph crimes with that, right? Or you could photograph acts of abuse. So I think that there's a lot of power in this technology and I would, would love it to, I, you know, I, in my most optimistic moments, I think of Representable or our work over at openprecincts.org. These are projects that I think of as being the smartphone of redistricting where you can show uh, through an analytical tools whether an offense was committed. You can document um, uh, where communities live. You can even offer up your own map 
and give that map to redistrictors and say, look, this is who we are, this is where we live. And so I see that kind of thing as being really powerful. Uh, as Kyle and Pretty pointed out, there are states that take public input. Uh, there are hearings in most states, although not all states. And so an example would be in Michigan, uh, when we, um, uh, when the new commission there, there's a new commission that's gonna start its work next year. Uh, when they start doing their work, I think an ideal use case is for the representable team to work with them to take public input and then translate it. I mean, that's just an example of, of what can happen. Uh, there's other projects, uh, this is getting a little bit of field, but, uh, but we're currently about to open up software tools for anyone to redistrict, to draw a full district map. And we're teaming up with software companies to make, uh, to put it in people's hands. We're gonna, we're gonna jazz it up by having a contest where people are gonna use the software, draw their perfect map and then submit it. And then we're gonna you know, give out prizes we think and, and the idea would be to basically have a map drawing contest, make it fun. Because these are things that honestly, if you have the right tech tools, a smart high school student can draw a pretty good quality map. And so my thinking is that, uh, that there's just a huge opportunity to, um, to really, um, to, to really disintermediate, to like make it easy for citizens to have direct input. And you know, like you say, uh, the money cost is surprisingly small. I mean, look, we're at the end of a campaign season and whatever happens, hundreds of millions of dollars were spent on Senate races. And, uh, and it's just not clear, uh, you know, like I would say that, that it's sort of this weird stalemate where, uh, where it could have been done for a 10th of money, a billion dollars, right? Or I don't know exactly how much, but we're talking about billion dollar scale effort into running a campaign. Meanwhile, uh, you know, a fraction of a percentage point of that, um, could actually build technology that completely short circuits the process and, and do everything from represent citizens uh, to, um, to, I don't know, remediate the effects of a bad census. I mean, there's just, the possibilities for drawing lines uh, are enormous. So th th those are my initial thoughts about, um, uh, about, your, uh, about your sentiments. Um, do, you see, do you see other work done in this space that, that uh, you know, are there other, tech-oriented groups that are springing up to, to make change? I mean, in some way, yeah, I mean, in some ways, this has been the, like, the year of technology and campaigns because a lot of things that uh, were considered interesting experiments, right? Social organizing uh, through online methods used to be a small thing because it was like, you know, most uh, organizing was canvassing, but now a lot of those technology tech tools became the main way that people were doing voter contact. Um, you know, so I think a lot of technology has actually got upgraded in the, in the response to the pandemic and what organizing looked. I mean, I think this idea around what will be technology tools around uh, census remediation will end up, I think, mattering a lot because I think by all accounts, people think that it was quite difficult. Uh, uh, it was underfunded as a census. Um, uh, and so, what might be ways that uh, municipalities and others might be able to use administrative data to um, be, able, be able to update their counts, I think might be one area. I think what are ways that, you know, um, you know, folks might be able to raise their hand and say, you know, this is where a community uh, and we were, you know, massively undercounted for X, Y, and Z reasons. So those at least strike me as, like sort of immediate things that will matter on the democracy question. And then I think, um, uh, you know, I, you know, the part that I think uh, you do a great job of, I would love to sort of um, to hear from the students too, which is just this idea that like, uh, I feel like there's always like an impact. People are intensely interested by politics, but they also feel an imposter syndrome of like, I'm sure there's like the experts and they've got it all figured out. And what are some tangible ways uh, you and they have, you know, like, you know, like, I don't know, Sam, if you expected that you'd be as much of a, um, a, a political animal and be able to actually be able to be part of this process as much as you have become, this idea that you actually can make a contribution, figure out some niche and drive, uh, and you've done it on the, on, the, on the data tools and analysis side. I think that would be, I think, interesting as people sort of go into next year to sort of say, you know, if you feel engaged by this process, whether you're feeling optimistic or down or a mix, uh, what's a way that, that you can channel that energy forward? Yeah, I mean, I guess my take on it is that 
it's often the case that people treat politics as a spectator sport. You know, you log on to a, like the way that you would look at a sports program or a sports site, um, it's no coincidence that a data guy like Nate Silver, um, you know, his background is in sports statistical analysis. Uh, I, you know, he invented a baseball metric that made him well known uh, in that crowd. Um, but, you know, at some level, like, look, I, I bet he's not, well, I shouldn't say, but I don't know whether he's a good baseball player. Uh, but, um, but politics is different. Politics is like a sport where if you get worked up, you can run down onto the field and do something. You can run for office, you can write letters, you can, you can, you can do all these things. And, um, and my take on the technology is that there are plenty of people who have the ability to write letters to the editor to their local paper or to go to a town hall meeting or to or a school board meeting, whatever it might be in your local community. Um, why shouldn't they be able to draw maps? Why shouldn't they be able to say, look, you know, there's those of us in the farming community over here uh, in between, you know, whatever, north of Lansing, Michigan, or wherever it might be. Uh, so I think that that kind of um, empowerment is, uh, I think, critical. And yeah, you know, just look, democracy is looking a little rickety at the moment. Our institutions uh, seemed to work pretty well, say, 50 years ago, but as more people uh, get a seat at the table, as the society gets more diverse, uh, and as we get more closely divided, like there are, there are both opportunities and bitter divisions. And my take is that in the next five, 10 years, we have a huge burden as a nation to, to repair democracy, to make it stronger. Uh, and I, you know, I'll be honest and say that in some ways it's gonna be kind of a rough patch. I mean, we, you can see these acrimonious disputes over the presidential election. How are we gonna get past that? And, um, and my hope is, that the kind of work that we're doing, the kind of work that these guys are doing um, will, um, will bring, will make it easier for citizens to give input, like that kind of little r republicanism where they have an effect on those who represent them. So, you know, I, I, now I, I'm trying to be optimistic, uh, but there's a lot of turmoil right now. Uh, this week especially would be the most tumultuous week of you know, things, things don't seem to be getting better, at least based on the trajectory of 2020. But you know, you get a vaccine and then Zoom meetings can become optional. And you, uh, you, get, you get the census data and then we can focus on a very concrete task, which is how to draw good maps and so on. So I feel like 2021, lots of opportunities to do good. That's, uh, that's my optimistic take. Um, let's see. So in the remaining time, um, should we maybe let's should we bring on Preeti and Kyle and it's just uh, kind of all chat and let's see if uh, questions come up in the in the Q and A. Uh, I think that people are in viewer mode. We, we'd be I should say to every anyone in the audience, uh, we'd be delighted to take any questions, and uh, and we're really interested in questions having to do with census or social entrepreneurship or what the students are up to, um, and uh, and I think that uh, here's a question. Okay, well, this is a good question. All right, so. Um, Oh, I definitely want to see. Okay, so as I'm going to read out this question, so I'm going to let you guys take this one. There's a question about how one defines community of interest. Is a consensus necessary to define a community of interest? That's that's the question, isn't it? That's right ahead. Such a tough question, um, and a huge part of what we're doing is is really evaluating this. Um, what happens when? Uh, a bunch of people draw a community and it's roughly the same, but what happens if there's overlapping communities and they're different in various ways? Um, and so we're working on a few different ways to approach this. Um, we've got some really exciting stuff in the works, including um, some work even within the more academic space on this. Um, and so that's one of the big questions that we're uh, really asking of ourselves and asking of the redistricting process in the coming year. I will say that it's a fuzzy definition, but at the same time, it is written in law. I mean, communities of interest are listed in state redistricting laws, uh, and sometimes they go to efforts to define them. Uh, communities that are joined by language or worship or economic activity or other shared interests, it could be an environmental watershed. And so there's a wide range of, of criteria that could be used to define a community of interest. Uh, one problem to my thinking is that they used, they're typically used in, uh, a pre, as a pretext for a lawsuit, and uh, and so they're used in the breach after the lines have been drawn. But 
But I think one possible great superpower that could come from having a lot of communities of interest drawn in advance as, as representable can do um, is to um, uh, have those in advance and be ready for as inputs to the process rather than something that gets referenced afterwards. And so I think that it's a legitimate question, but I think it's, uh, uh, I, I think it's answerable both legally and I think there's some opportunity there. Um, we have another question. Have you looked at the effects of the disclosure avoidance system applying to differential privacy to cloak the data of the 2020 US Census? Oh, we have a knowledgeable person in the audience. Um, who would like to talk about differential privacy? I'm, I'm glad to jump on this grenade if, if, if nobody else wants. Um, so here, let me explain the question. If you have small enough census tracts or blocks, um, it's possible mathematically to back out the identities and personal uh, characteristics of people who answered the census. And so the Census Bureau has come up with a mathematical tool called differential privacy, uh, which basically takes some of the information and mixes it up a little bit so that just there's just enough stirring of the data to, uh, to anonymize it. And the risk there is that it adds noise that in fact um, uh, can lead to inaccuracies in representing, representing communities. Um, my take on this is that I would say that the effects of this differential privacy are probably more minor than one might imagine. Um, for one thing, there's a certain amount of differential privacy that's inter inadvertently introduced by the fact that, that response rates to the census are not 100%. So the fact that extra people are added um, uh, by figuring out wh who's in a house without talking to them directly, that actually adds some uncertainty. The other thing I should say about differential privacy is that it has the biggest effects in very sparsely populated areas. My understanding is that that's really where differential privacy can, uh, can uh, have a consequence. Um, I think that um, in this case, I think the, the one thing that's really useful is to use other kinds of data. So I'm, I'm gonna answer a slightly different question than the one that's asked. Um, there's census data that's gonna be used for redistricting, but there's some question, question about its accuracy, not only because differential privacy, uh, but for other reasons having to do with the way the census was run this year. I think that uh, state demographic data, so if there's a state demographer, that kind of information can be useful. And finally, um, I think that, um, yeah, citizen generated information, I think could play a good complementary role in, um, in clearing up ambiguities. And so I think that, um, I think the problems of differential privacy are not so great as one might fear for purposes of drawing districts. Uh, but I think there are other sources of data. And broadly, I think those others uh, should be uh, uh, come into play. Okay, so we're pretty low on time. Last question, I think, or maybe one more after this. How do you strike a balance between community of interest representation in a district versus over concentrating certain like-minded groups in a small number of dist districts? Who should make that decision? Probably not us, right guys? Yeah. Well, do you, do, you guys, do you want to quickly just explain the concept of packing versus cracking? This idea that, oh, yeah, that's a good that idea. It, that's just in general, when it comes to gerrymandering, you can actually, yeah. it, it's a balance thing because- you Right, can so you can deprive, that's right. Thank you, Kumar. You can deprive representation by cramming people into a single district. This is a real problem. So I would say the, the issue at hand there is that there needs to be a process in place that can draw the lines fairly. And the best process is one involves members of one party and the other major party and independents who don't, who don't affiliate with either party. And I think that that's where the human part of the process becomes very important. And so an independent commission is one really good way to avoid that kind of packing. And as Kumar says, you can either jam people into a district so they, they only get one district or you can split them up as Prince William County got split up in the example. And the difficulty is how to use these communities of interest in a responsible manner. So I absolutely agree that this representable tool is just providing the fuel to do something good. So I, I think that would be a, a good way to put it. Um, we're, uh, I think we're very low on time, but let me just say, okay, so could use of technology for map drawing lead to increasing polarization? Um, yeah, I, I think that's sort of a different side of that coin. It's a similar question. I agree that with the questioner that, uh, that map drawing could increase polarization, but again, I think the human process is important. And there are rules in the law that say that uh, maps should not be drawn to favor a party or disfavor or favor an incumbent. And I think that that's where the law comes in. And so really, I think the combination of tech and law is really gonna be the answer here. Well, unfortunately, I think we're out of time, but I do wanna say, um, unless uh, anyone has any last words, I really appreciate everything that everyone here has done. Uh, and I wanna thank you all for, for being part of the conversation today. Uh,
That was really good, guys. So, uh, I think we're probably going to get cut off, but I thought that you guys were great.